and uh, friends. A warm welcome to this uh, webinar series on COVID-19 and gender equality, living up to the challenge. The timeliness of this initiative and the pertinent discussions that the network held during the first two sessions have shown once more how relevant the International Agenda Champions Initiative is. Switzerland is uh, pleased to support it and I'm delighted to be part of this network and to moderate the closing session of the webinar series on the topic Build Back Better, Shaping a Gender Equitable Post-COVID-19 World. My name is Valentin Selweger and I am the permanent representative of Switzerland to the United Nations here in Geneva. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, first of all, I would like to give a warm welcome to our distinguished uh, panelists today. Uh, Dorothy Tembo, the acting uh, executive director of the International Trade Center here in Geneva. Dr. Khalid Koser, the executive director of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience uh, Fund, also here in Geneva. Ambassador Mariangela Zappia, who is the permanent representative of Italy to the United Nations in New York. And Lise Kingo, who is the CEO and executive director of the UN Global uh, Compact, also in New York. I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that I'm very much looking forward to your valuable inputs and to the discussion with you. But before handing over, let me share a few points from a Geneva-based uh, perspective. 2020 was intended to be a groundbreaking year for agenda equality. Instead, the pandemic has contributed to deepening pre-existing inequalities, to exposing vulnerabilities, and to enhance political, economic, and social discrimination around the world. It has become evident that the pandemic is not impacting everyone equally. In previous sessions of the IGC webinar series, we discussed factors which put women at a higher risk. It is now time to focus our discussion on recovery and on how we can use this disrupting moment to build a more just and equal world. It is still possible to make 2020 a groundbreaking year for gender equality. The motivation behind this Build Back Better concept is to make communities stronger, more resilient and sustainable following a disaster or a shock such as this one. As a more equitable and resilient world is in the interest of everyone, women and girls, as well as men and boys, the question is how do we get there? The first point I'd like to make is that women need to have a seat at the table. And by that I mean a fair share of seats at each and every table. Women's representation and equal participation to help shape, implement and monitor COVID responses and recovery is key to building back better. A second point is to target women and girls when addressing the social economic impact of the pandemic. Data across the globe have shown that the economic impact of the pandemic disproportionately affects women. Women still earn less and are more likely to be employed in the informal sector with no job security and no safety net. Panelists will provide concrete examples of how to address gender inequalities in COVID-19 economic recovery plans. Thirdly, I would like to insist on the central role of multilateral institutions and the multilateral world more broadly in building back better. The COVID-19 pandemic has confirmed the importance and relevance of multilateralism and of multilateral cooperation. 
the response, policy guidance and support provided by the multilateral world has been impressive. In times when national governments might sometimes risk losing sight of some central aspects of the crisis, statements by different multilateral actors have shed light on various important issues of the pandemic, including, and that is very important, its effects on fragile and conflict affected communities. The Secretary General's Response and Recovery Fund, WHO's Strategic Preparedness and Response Plan, as well as the Global uh, Humanitarian Response Plan, constitute a comprehensive, well-sequenced and coordinated approach. Switzerland supports all three responses, as well as the integration of a gender perspective in all of them. I would also like to particularly highlight the policy paper of the UN Secretary General on the impact of COVID-19 on women and his appeal for a halt of violence against women. Many of us have been impressed and I would say proud to see how other actors in Geneva, such as for instance, the different Geneva platforms or the IGC have been able to quickly adapt and to contribute to shaping COVID responses and recovery. Different webinars and uh, virtual ex exchanges have allowed us to bring together actors from many corners of the world in order to brainstorm, to reflect and to come up with promising and innovative responses to today's challenges. Those initiatives have underlined the importance of multi-stakeholder diplomacy and have illustrated how small agile setups can complement the work of the main multilateral actors. In that sense, the extra extraordinary circumstances have catapulted us in the future of multilateralism. As virtual and hybrid meetings will most likely stay with us in the future, it is crucial to make sure they are also inclusive. We will be asking our panelists today how can we rebuild our societies, our economies and public institutions to ensure that we leave no one behind? They will share their perspectives on how we can turn this crisis into an opportunity and develop more equitable, sustainable and inclusive norms. This is also crucial as other crises, including the climate crisis, will creep up on us. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, turning now to our, towards our distinguished panelists, we are looking forward to learning from the wealth of it, your experience. What approaches have your organizations adopted to build back better? Which practices are proving to be useful and could guide others? I would like to address the first two questions to Ambassador Maria Angela Zappia, the permanent representative of Italy in New York. If I may add, Ambassador Zappia was inter alia, also previously the head of the EU delegation here in Geneva, and of course knows Geneva well. Ambassador, I would like to ask you two questions. Italy, was the first European country to be significant, uh, significantly affected by COVID-19. Now, as your country starts to emerge from the lockdown, what lessons have you learned and what is being done to support women, both in Italy and in Europe? And the second question, if you now, as we look at the global challenges that are likely to follow COVID-19, how does the multilateral system have to adapt to ensure an effective and gender equitable planning and response? Ambassador, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Ambassador, dear Valentin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in this panel uh, and it's, uh, it's really a, an honor for me to be part of this group and I take it very seriously as uh, I'm, I'm committed to the mission that we all have. It's a great pleasure also to be with uh, uh, such a distinguished group of uh, friends and colleagues. And, and uh, thank you for reminding also my experience in Geneva. 
I, it's a very uh, dear to me that those years are very dear to me because I think that a lot of uh, very substantial work is done in Geneva uh, through not only the UN but all the agencies and, and different organizations. Uh, it's really where things are done. Um, so it's, it's a nice souvenir for me. Um, well, you asked me about Italy, and, and of course Italy, uh, you, you said it was one of the countries that was most um, hit by, by the, the virus, um, and, and we learned uh, a lot from this unfortunate experience. Um, we could see, first of all, how a very solid, considered one of the best in the world, uh, well-functioning healthcare system was put under strain. Um, and this is because of the violence of, uh, of the way uh, the country was hit by the pandemic. Um, we learned that uh, swift and timely action at the very beginning of, the, of an emergency like this one, where, wherever it starts, uh, is essential to contain um, its spread everywhere. We are connected. We are on the same boat, as we like to say in Italy. Uh, so my second point is that uh, international cooperation is needed and is uh, the key, not only to the response uh, in the immediate emergence, but also in the medium and the, and the long term. Uh, our national response was shaped around basically three concepts, transparency, graduality, proportionality. And of course, it was based, uh, really anchored on scientific evidence. And uh, I, I really believe that these are uh, issues that we have to take into consideration when we think, we think about the, the, the kind of leadership that we also want when uh, we, are, we have to face uh, uh, a crisis like, like this one. No country can face this crisis alone, but if we are um, transparent and, and uh, uh, gradual, and proportionate in our response and mostly uh, if we are uh, science based on our response uh, I think we are giving the best response. Um, a word for our people, our health healthcare uh, workers, our essential workers, uh, they have been engaged in an unprecedented struggle and we will not stop thanking uh, them for their dedication and sacrifice. Scientific research uh, to develop and produce uh, a vaccine is one of the good examples that, that we have to focus on when we think of international cooperation. Um, Italy has been among the first promoters of an international alliance for, for the research for the vaccine, uh, its distribution, its production, its distribution, and we should all commit and invest on it. Uh, this is the typical uh, um, uh, uh, national community response and, uh, and we need to, to really uh, um, help this response to be effective. My other point is that women, as you said, uh, have been on the front line of this battle, uh, not only fighting in the hospitals but, uh, and providing essential services, but also taking care of, of children, of elderly, uh, often while walking from, from home. Uh, they must be also at the core of the response. Uh, if we want to build a better and more sustainable future. Um, a, a word on leadership, I, I, I took it before. We also learned that good leadership makes the difference. And I, I'm making this point simply because I have the impression that um, some women uh, leader uh, gave indeed the, the right responses. They were clear but firm in their communication. Uh, they were empathic. They favor science over politics. Uh, and these are features that I think we have to keep in mind. I, I don't want to say that there aren't men that have the same qualities, not at all. Uh, but is a, is a fact that, that, that some country responded better and uh, some of those countries are lead, uh, by, led by women. So uh, let me maybe uh, go to, um, to, to us, to, to Italy. Um, I, I think we have to, to, to look at um, the response that we're giving in two ways. One is how women were particularly put under pressure, how women are, in a way, I don't like the term, but victim also of this crisis, but also as women are crucial actors in this crisis. Uh, Italian researchers and scientists have been 
providing frequent contribution to the response, uh, both in Italy and abroad. Uh, I just would like to mention a few. Maria Capobianchi, she was the leader of an all-women team at the Spallanzani Hospital that first isolated the viral strain. Annalisa Malara, uh, the anesthesiologist from Codogno, this small village where everything started in Italy, who made the first diagnosis of the virus. Ilaria Capua, she's a department director uh, at the Emerging, Emerging Pathogens Institute of University of Florida. Vittoria Colizza, director of the Epidemiologic Center of the French Institute of Health and Medical Research. Uh, their stories prove that women in science are making the difference and that they must be an integral part of any recovery strategy. Uh, so this guides us also in the policies to really increase the presence of women in STEM. That's, that's really essential, uh, not only is essential because, because it's, it's right, uh, but also because bear, it bears results. Um, while the health emergency risks to slow down public initiatives and policies aimed at gender parity, uh, proactive measures should be undertaken. Uh, in light of the differentiated impact of the pandemic on women and girls, uh, to relaunch women's employment, improve flexibility in the organization of work, break down barriers in access to entrepreneurship, contrast discrimination and gender-based violence. And post-COVID-19 recovery strategies should encompass actions to increase women's access to labor market, uh, strengthen family support services, facilitate reconciliation between private and professional life. Smart working, digitalization uh, are effective to increase women uh, and families' well-being and resilience while boosting productivity and effectiveness. So what has the Italian government done in, in this first uh, emergency phase? Uh, a few uh, measures that I'd like to, uh, to mention. Um, the establishment of a task force called Women for New Renaissance uh, under the leadership of the Minister of Equal Opportunities and Family composed of 12 women representing several sectors from science to humanities in order to uh, help uh, support the government with ideas and proposals for the post-COVID-19 uh, social, cultural and economic restart. Uh, the increase by uh, 5 million euro of, of the special section of the fund for small and medium enterprises dedicated to female entrepreneurship. A new awareness campaign to support victims of violence during the COVID-19 emergency. We saw a, an incredible increase of violence at home um, and the increased activity of the anti-violence centers, both through uh, psycho. Uh, psycho sorry, physical assistance and remote support via a toll-free number and a dedicated app. The identification of new housing solution to host women who are victims of violence. The provision of 30 million euros to regional governments to support activities to counter gender-based violence. And the introduction of family supporting measures like an extraordinary leave and financial aid for parents with the aim of supporting them during the period of temporary closure of school activities. Unfortunately, schools, as you know, remain uh, closed. We are also a member of the European Union, proud member of the European Union, and the European Union itself uh, adopted a number of instruments, mobilized a number of instruments. Uh, the EU commissioners for equality, for health and food safety, and for jobs and social rights, and Aged since uh, the beginning of the crisis to support the protection of fundamental rights in the EU member states, uh, with a special attention to specific vulnerable groups, including women, uh, men and children who are isolated um, uh, at home uh, with abusive partners or family members. Um, the team uh, Euro package, uh, uh, Euro 20 billion, that was launched, fund that was launched last April 8th by the EU uh, to support partner countries affected by the crisis, dedicated great attention to the protection and promotion of the human rights of all women and girls. Uh, in order to counter, to counter sexual and gender-based violence, along with national measures taken by member states, the EU is also adapting the EU-UN Spotlight Initiative 
uh, to better respond to, to these risks. Uh, under the Spotlight uh, initiative, the EU has mobilized uh, $137 million for direct and flexible support to women's and grassroots uh, organizations. On the, the second question you asked me was on, on, uh, on the system, but you said already a lot. Um, the UN system, I think, responded uh, quite well, and uh, I, I have to say it in a very joined up manner. And uh, the, 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 the three response uh, by the system, uh, of course, um, launched by, by the Secretary General, are really a, a good package of what we need to support uh, as, as international community. And, and we should all be engaged in that. Um, I would add to this, uh, as I said before, the Alliance for Vaccine. I think it's really crucial that we all cooperate in that. Uh, to me, is also an example of um, how um, this virus is reshaping geopolitics and how we should all uh, work for a geopolitics, international corporate core. I think the Alliance on Vaccines is um, an example of that. And, and then uh, I, I think also the membership in the UN uh, very quickly reacted to, to the crisis. First of all, we were able very quickly to, to start working again. Um, we are very active uh, on a number of issues. Uh, let me just mention one that is very, very dear to, to Italy, but also we share it with, with uh, some other uh, countries. And this is food security and nutrition, for instance. Uh, and we launched here um, Italy's chair of, of a group of friends for food security and nutrition. We launched here the first um, really global conversation on that, including uh, not only the Deputy Secretary General, the, the uh, head of the uh, agencies most involved, so the, the agencies uh, FAO, uh, WFP and, and IFAD. It was the first joined up conversation on the issue. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, tackle this issue again uh, with a second meeting and we are really trying to see what is needed immediately, what is needed in the medium term and, and what is needed in the long term. And I have to say, and maybe with this I leave because uh, I don't want to monopolize, um, when we look at the medium and, and, uh, and uh, long term, but also in, in what we do as an emergency response, I think we have a compass and the compass is really this uh, Agenda 2030 and uh, the, the, social, uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Goal. Uh, we don't need to reinvent. We are simply more challenged by this crisis. We don't have to forget the agenda. We don't have to forget our objective for uh, 2030. I think really uh, this is even more an opportunity if, uh, if you want to, uh, to, to focus more on what is needed. And to us, Italy, as, as a, really a, a country that believes in multilateralism, um, recover better um, is, is really the challenge. Uh, and, and we believe that it's possible to recover better. We believe that it's really possible. I think this crisis also demonstrated how, for instance, on, on, on climate change, really action from us, human being, can have an impact. When I, when I see the, the skies of Milan or, or Los Angeles uh, or, or other big cities in, in China, and I see blue, uh, I understand why. Uh, of course, it's also because production was stopped, unfortunately, but it's also uh, the impact that we have every day on, uh, on, uh, on the planet and on climate. So I think there are ways uh, to uh, really recover better by putting again at the core of what we need to do uh, first and foremost um, climate change. And, and our environment, uh, I think this is, this is crucial. And then, of course, food security comes with that. And I have to say, a gender lens in, in that response is, uh, is particularly um, uh, important. Uh, there was a recent study from uh, an Italian uh, alliance that is doing fantastic work. It's called the Italian Alliance for Sustainable B Development, ASBIS. Um, they have uh, introduced the idea of transformative resilience. And I think, uh, I think this is an interesting concept that we should also 
um, start to introduce in the discussion here, uh, here in the UN. Uh, we need to be more re resilient than we were, but at the same time, we have to uh, transform the way we are resilient uh, in a way that is really uh, bouncing forward and instead of bouncing back and bouncing forward, uh, doing the right things. And these right things are, frankly, they are there. We don't need to, uh, to invent. We just have to transform the way we respond to those challenges. I will stop here, ready to ask, uh, to um, reply to questions after, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mariangela. Um, and I hope that we will have an opportunity to come back to this uh, uh, concept of transformative uh, resilience, because I think it is really something that should be looked at for this whole recovery phase. Perhaps just one remark, if you allow me. Uh, you mentioned uh, climate uh, change and the effect the COVID crisis now has on pollution. You who know Geneva, um, at this moment, people say we never had such a good view of Mont Blanc <laughs> years. And I do hope that you will get an opportunity to see Mont Blanc is towering like it was outside our windows. And I think it illustrates for many of us uh, really the difference um, between um, climate change uh, as we had it before the COVID crisis and uh, as we have it today. Uh, it's how it could be and how it should be. So thank you very much for this uh, remark. Turning now to um, Dr. Koser, the Executive Director of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund. The GSERF, for those who do not know it, uh, supports local community level initiatives to strengthen resilience against violist extremist agenda. An academic by training, Khalid, uh, Dr. Koser, is professor at Maastricht University and chairs the WEF uh, Global Future <coughs> on Migration. Khalid, also two questions to you. Uh, the first would be, with most governments uh, focusing on the pandemic, terrorist groups could see a window of opportunity to strike and to attack. In your view, what can be done to prevent this? Now, the second question, the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to hit country harder where governance structures are already fragile today. What can be done at the community level to mitigate these risks? How can we ensure that women are included at all levels? Please, Ali. Well, thank you, Ambassador Zellbeger. And let me also thank IGC for putting together this very important uh, series. Uh, can I start perhaps by just offering my best wishes to the panelists, to the audience, to their families, to their colleagues and to their organisations. This is a very difficult time for uh, all of us. I'm very pleased to report that we at GSERF, the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, are doing well. Uh, we have new team members, we are making new grants, we've received new contributions from our generous donors, and we're also generating lots of new ideas as well. So it's been quite a, a fruitful time, albeit a difficult time for us in our uh, organisation. I thought to look at this intersection between violent extremism and the COVID-19 pandemic, I'd very simply ask what is the problem? And then since this is supposed to be, I think, a solutions oriented uh, session, uh, perhaps let me try to answer the question, what then needs to be done? So what is the problem? I think the first point to make is that uh, the link between COVID-19 and violent extremism is not in fact to do with the virus at all. It's to do with government responses. That's where the challenge uh, lies. And I think it's fair to categorize government responses in three uh, ways in this respect. Firstly, clearly governments around the world absolutely credibly have responded directly to the pandemic, for example, through lockdown and social distancing. That is, of course, the right thing to do, and I think that's been proven. However, it does inevitably have unintended and secondary consequences. One example would be that in many communities where we are supporting efforts to, to resist violent extremism, more and more young people are in their homes, more and more young people are on the internet, and therefore more and more young people are vulnerable to radicalization to violent extremism on the internet. There's a good example of an unintended secondary consequence of otherwise very good government policies. I think a second category of government policies are perhaps less uh, benign. 
it seems to me that some governments in the world today, and I'm certainly not going to name names, but some governments in the world today are instrumentalizing uh, the pandemic to their own benefits. They are using the pandemic uh, for political communication. They are using emergency powers to stall civil liberties. They are challenging electoral integrity on the basis of the pandemic as an excuse. And they're also using state resources, sometimes I think inappropriately. What all of that means for violent extremism is that it risks undermining confidence between communities and people and their government. And we know that that's an important driving force for violent extremism and for recruitment to violent extremism. And I think the third category that you might put government responses in uh, around the world today is responses that are either inactive or simply inadequate. There are certain parts of the world, for example, where health systems simply can't cope with the challenge. There are certain parts of the world where governments are simply not present in certain territories and parts of their countries. And we know from previous experience, the risk is that extremist groups and violent extremists and terrorist groups will begin to fill the vacuum and will begin to claim some sort of legitimacy through their provision of healthcare and education and other aspects. So again, government response is not the virus, often benign and positive government responses, sometimes uh, in inactivity, sometimes not very positive government responses, I think have risked fueling some violent extremism around the world. I think together they have accelerated violent extremism. I think together they've increased the risk of radicalization of certain vulnerable people in certain communities. And I think together they have reduced community resilience that many of us on this call and in the audience have spent many years trying uh, to build. That I think is the problem at the moment, Ambassador Zellweger. Let me briefly turn to what I think needs to be done. Firstly, uh, as, as pertains to government responses, and I gave you those three categories. I think for the first category, at the very least, governments need to be aware of and begin to address the secondary and unintended consequences of their otherwise positive policies towards dealing with the pandemic. The, the idea of lockdown having an effect on young people at home, uh, for example. The second category of, of perhaps rather less benign government responses, I think this really is a further call for greater transparency and accountability by governments and by policy makers. And for the third category where governments simply can't cope with the challenge, certainly this is a call for humanitarian aid and I agree with Ambassador Zapier that the, the UN is doing a very good job there, although clearly still needs far more funding from the international community. And uh, I mean, responses such as deferring debt repayments for certain poor countries in the world at the moment. So I think a series of policy responses at the government level that are needed. At the level of preventing violent extremism, which is where our fund GSERV uh, works, uh, it does seem to me that there is a real risk, just as the risk of violent extremism is increasing for the reasons that I provided, resources for preventing violent extremism are decreasing. And I think there are very good reasons why that is. Firstly, of course, our current resources are, I think, understandably being diverted towards immediate health care. That's an understandable response. But it does mean that resources are being drained away from preventing violent extremism. Secondly, if you look at the lessons of the global financial crisis a few years ago, what you saw was that in, in the years following the global financial crisis, foreign aid budgets were restricted and really focused on some of the immediate priorities. That means there's a real risk that in the next two or three years, the funding that has gone to preventing violent extremism will be withdrawn and limited. So again, I think there's a, a desperate irony here. Just when we need more investment in preventing violent extremism, I think the risk is we are going to get less investment in preventing violent uh, extremism. But I think the third suite of solutions really lies at the community uh, level. And it does seem to me that whether you're a government official or indeed an international donor, if you don't carry the trust of communities where you're trying to make a difference, then you won't succeed. And it does seem to me that trust and confidence between communities and governments and donors is absolutely fundamental and is often at risk in the current uh, context. This is, of course, a session of the International Gender Champions. It would be remiss of me not to say a couple of words about women. And let me just specifically make this point. Our experience at the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, working with local communities on trying to prevent violent extremism, is that absolutely women are the key change agents. If you don't engage women in local communities, you will not succeed in trying to build engagement and resilience. And yet, at the moment, it is women in those communities who are most silenced and most affected. Again, the irony, we need women to be engaged in order to promote resilience, and yet at the moment, they seem to be the most silenced uh, and, and the most protected and shielded from uh, the work that they need to do. 
I think, Ambassador Zellweger, to, to conclude what that means to me, what does building back better look like uh, in a more gender equal world? I think it looks like governments that are more transparent and more accountable to their people. I think it looks like a system that continues to invest in preventing violent extremism. We have particular interests, of course, in that at the GSEF. And I think it, it involves a system that recognises absolutely the critical role of women in local communities if we're going to succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Khalid. And I also a theme that um, Ambassador Zabia has already uh, alluded to is the, the different roles of women in society during this COVID crisis, on the one hand as most affected group, but on the other hand also as actors of change. And that will probably be interesting also perhaps at a later stage to discuss a bit more in depth. But before we turn to the, uh, to the more discussion part, I would now like to turn to Dorothy Tembo the Acting Executive Director of the International Trade Center. Dorothy Tembo has 30 years experience in trade and development and has previously served as the Executive Director of the Enhanced Integrated Framework Program, which is based at the World Trade Organization. Ms. Tembo, the economic crisis spurred by COVID-19 has a devastating impact on business, but it is hitting small and medium-sized enterprises even harder. From your work with women-owned SMEs, what actions are needed to keep them in business and what has ITC done in this regard with its She Trades initiative? And the second question, the crisis has highlighted the critical importance of global supply chains where women play an important, though often invisible role. Do you think that the crisis could pave the way for more equitable trade and what policy responses would be needed to achieve that? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very, very delighted to be part of this conversation this afternoon. And in responding to, to the first question, I wanted to direct myself to, to four elements. The first element is the role of micro, small, and medium enterprises in the economy of, I mean, in, uh, to the economies of, the, of all the countries, but more particularly in the context of the recovery post uh, COVID-19. Clearly, we are all very aware that 90% of businesses today are constituted uh, by MSMEs, as we often um, uh, call them in abbreviation. But we also know that they do employ 70% plus, if we take into account perhaps even the informal sector, uh, of the workforce in most of these countries. And therefore, they will be key to the attainment of the sustainable development goals. And I couldn't agree more with uh, Ambassador's uh, earlier intervention, which said that we should not lose focus on our ultimate goal on meeting the sustainable development goals. I know this is a setback, but what we should be doing is trying to find ways and means of how we reposition ourselves in the new context and try to, to forge ahead, which is precisely why it becomes important for us to have a very clear understanding of what is happening and how we can respond to that. Uh, linked to that is the fact that I wanted to highlight. From a perspective of the World Bank, they have established that to get to 2030 and ensure that we are really in the right place, we will need to have 600 million jobs created. And much of this is what would come out of uh, um, MSMEs. And therefore, it begs the question, or it, to me, it's very clear that the agenda for prioritizing what uh, MSMEs can bring not only to, to the context in, in terms of addressing their recovery, but also looking beyond, uh, has to be a, prior, a priority. And we have to look at this. It is also a fact that you know, women in all this have been left behind. I think a lot of examples have already been given in terms of how women are left behind. 
they have not been able to participate effectively, but they have also not been able to accrue uh, the benefits of trade and indeed in terms of looking at how their contribution is towards the developmental efforts. So it's certainly uh, important that we start looking at how we uh, critically look at what is happening and particularly looking at the impact on women and what solutions we would be providing that of course go to the general response to the situation, but certainly also looking deeper into how women can have that extra support to make them be able to reposition in the, in the current context. The second point I wanted to speak to relates to the fact that I, I do recognize that by and large, the, 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 the current situation we're in is one that reflects a health crisis but at the same time, it is one that speaks to a social and economic crisis. And I think the solutions to me have to address both these elements uh, and not to wait in terms of sequencing the, the intervention. So it becomes particularly important that we are obviously as a priority trying to make sure that we are mitigating on the help side, but at the same time as a minimum, at least trying to sustain what is available in as far as uh, uh, business is concerned, because the this is what the recovery will be dependent on. So we have to manage ourselves. And I'll come back to, to this point a little bit later on. The third uh, uh, aspect I wanted to share is the fact that the crisis actually increases pre-existing economic inequalities and challenges that are confronted mostly by vulnerable countries, but in particular, uh, women. And what is it that I'm speaking to? We know that we have pre-existing inequalities that re relate to ownership of um, women businesses in, in, in exporting uh, sector. We still are at one, one to five in terms of that ownership. And we know that uh, uh, we also have a, a generally a situation where women earn less, 20% uh, less than their men, men folk. Uh, third is that uh, where you do have women-owned businesses, they are still confronted with many, many challenges, amongst which you have those related to uh, uh, finance. And I will speak a little more in detail in terms of the interventions uh, to that uh, particular fact. So it, it, it is very clear that with the current situation, we will have uh, issues getting worse than they were before, uh, la largely because the immediate impact that we are seeing from the, the data and the analysis that we are doing, we are getting uh, this, the sense that you know, sectors where women are actively engaged are the ones that are being hit hard. Which sectors are these? Tourism, agriculture, and, and many, many others that relate to women uh, being the ones that are very involved either directly or indirectly throughout that, that, that value chain. So it is important that we are looking at that. Added to that layer of issues is the imposition of the restrictions that have been taken for a genuinely important reason, which is to mitigate against the, the, the virus. Um, but in so doing, it has had uh, other, other implications. And earlier on, I think there was an intervention to say it's important for us to keep track on issues that are not, may not be directly linked to the, to the measure that has been put in place, but obviously having extended implications on uh, the different uh, sectors and indeed uh, the different uh, beneficiaries that we are looking at. So what is it that I'm trying to say here? The borders are closed. People cannot move from one country to, to another because of a good reason. But at the same time, how that has translated is effectively that business cannot happen. Most of the women are small businesses that are crossing the borders every day and cannot be able to do business. The way they are structured is, what is, is such that they're very small, their assets are very limited, they cannot you know, they cannot uh, take forward uh, uh, a long uh, period to sustain what would be demanded of them in this particular 
period, even those that are much higher up the chain and perhaps in a better position than the small ones, it is very clear that doing business in this environment where you have limitations on the borders is one that has become very challenging for them. And ultimately, this has affected the course of conducting business in certain respects has actually halted the business, in particular for the women. So these are some of the, the, the issues that I, I wanted to, to share, that we do definitely have a situation that has impacted on this category of, 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 uh, of people in a very different way from what it has, how it has impacted perhaps many, many others. So what is it that ITC is doing in the context of the She Trades Initiative, which is a women empowerment initiative? First, I must uh, uh, share that as an organization, She Trades is one part of the work that we are doing, but overall, we are looking at supporting uh, SMEs competitiveness uh, and therefore trying to enable them in their export efforts. But what we have done in this context is to have an, to, to do some work which gives us an overview of how things are evolving. And I wanted to, to, to stress that particular aspect because the analysis that we have done is up to this point. I do understand that within what we have done, there are countries that are just starting their curve of you know, being affected and impacted perhaps beyond what they are presently seeing, uh, uh, going beyond what is happening right now. Case in point, Africa. That curve is just starting on that part. But they have ultimately been affected by the fact that the demand on their products has, has decreased. And so they too have not been able to provide uh, the supply because their production, their production chains have also been, been affected but we still have to see the full impact of the curve. So what we are doing is obviously taking a progressive approach in terms of analyzing the situation and having a better understanding in terms of what is prevailing on the ground. What is it that we are seeing? Of course, as everybody says, there's a general decline, a, a, a good uh, indication that there will be a lot of uh, negative impacts in relation to the uh, uh, to the virus but what we have done specifically for for the for the women in this respect is to make sure that we have a, a more granular approach that tells us precisely how women are being affected what was it that we could do in the current context mindful of the fact that we would have to undertake broader a broader exercise to understand fuller implications was to reach out to our immediate beneficiaries and we undertook a survey. And that survey has enabled us to better understand precisely where we can start our interventions in terms of providing the support to the businesses. So what are the areas that have come up through this survey? The finance side is one that has been consistently coming up and it continues to uh, be one that comes up as one of the key issues in this current context. Basically, the women are saying to us, we cannot survive in the current context. We cannot continue to pay uh, salaries, rent, and whatever demands come because our capital base is very, very limited. How can you help us or how can others help us? Second point is the fact that within, which is more positive, is the fact that within all this uh, difficult situation, we have established that there are a few that have managed to sustain themselves to a certain point. And they have been sustaining themselves because they're using other means of trying to uh, do business. Basically, the digital, uh, the digital divide option is what is being uh, seen as a lifeline for some of them. And I will come back to part of what we are trying to do with respect to that. I also wanted to uh, uh, perhaps just say that aside from all these, uh, the two sides of the two aspects that I have raised, that they have been issues in relation to our understanding 
of the value chains and how those value chains can be repositioned in the current context. So we are doing studies to better understand how they've been impacted and how some of these actually can be repositioned to, to better respond to a situation such as the one we are confronted with, but also looking at the future. What exactly am I saying within that context? We have established that there are certain companies that have adjusted their production lines to be able to respond to the immediate needs. For instance, we have some uh, textiles companies that have shifted production to produce masks, to produce other necessary uh, medical requirements that are needed for now and to be provided within the context of a particular region that would be considered to be more domestic than, than the international side of things. So is this an opportunity? Perhaps, yes, which should be explored and we try to see how we work with the countries uh, to do that. I wanted to say that specifically what we have done in as far as the support uh, from ITC is concerned is one, we, we established very quickly that we needed to reskill uh, to reskill the, the business women and also provide knowledge in a way that is not done traditionally. So shifting more into a modality that can be utilized in the current context using virtue uh, learning skills, using virtue learning uh, tools to make sure that we are creating awareness around the issues that are happening, but also providing solutions as to how these women can be supported. And this is something that we have been doing with other partners that work with the initiative. So UPS is one, MERSC is another, but we are certainly building on this partnership to bring on board many, many other partners that we work with. Through this, we have had uh, webinars since April, and since April, we've reached out to almost half a million women. We will continue doing this um, on a regular basis to make sure that the women are indeed not feeling that they have been left alone in, in, in being supported, but that we are accompanying them in that process. Second point, as I alluded to earlier, is the work we are doing on the value chains and the repositioning there. So I will not go into a lot of, uh, a lot of um, detail on that, other than to add that we are working with the different businesses to coach the women, to be able to take them through these processes. On access to finance, what we are doing here is working with uh, the, the businesses in trying to better prepare them to be able to access some of the facilities that are at their disposal. Um, but beyond that, we are also working with them to identify alternative sources of uh, financing, taking into account that oftentimes uh, 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 small and medium enterprises are going considered to be very risky and therefore not, uh, not uh, easily able to access uh, the resources that are available to them because of the uh, demands on collateral and other requirements. I uh, wanted to say that in this context, we have been working with other financial institutions, partnering with them on the side of preparing the women, but to be able to access the different resources that are put at their disposal. But one aspect I wanted to highlight is also the work that we are doing in terms of trying to work with the United Nations colleagues, non-government organizations, and indeed private equity firms to establish uh, a fund which is commonly known as the SDG fund, uh, SDG 500, which is a pioneering impact investment platform to catalyze institutional investment. And the target for us there is to raise 500 million uh, dollars, $500 million, not from ITC, but in, in collaboration with many others, we bring together a core of six underlying funds to respond to the different aspects relating to uh, businesses. Uh, the last two points I wanted to make in this context uh, is the fact that we still continue to provide gender smart uh, procurement uh, solutions. 
So seeking to have more and more women participate in, uh, in public procurement in particular, but also where possible that they can go beyond that and uh, participate in other forms of uh, procurement that go beyond the public. But public, because we know that's where the bulk of the uh, resources would be or demand would be in terms of uh, women, uh, so, you know, women supply. The, the, the last point I wanted to make in relation to this was the She Trades Outlook, which is really a, a policy tool. Why is this important? I think earlier on there was some uh, reference to the need for us to understand uh, our context and be able to uh, make the necessary accompanying decisions that will enable us uh, position these countries better uh, as part of their recovery efforts. And here, what we are doing is linking this obviously to, to the governance structures. So working with the various institutional structures and building their capacity and indeed giving them the agility to be able to respond uh, in a changing environment is absolutely uh, part of what we are going to do. Do I see uh, this crisis paving more way for equitable trade? Um, absolutely, but I think it's something that will be dependent on the collective response that comes through. And here is where we all have to work together in terms of making sure that we are not only giving, keeping our eye on the objective of attaining the sustainable development goals, but that this is translating operationally on the ground because in my view, that's where that we, you know, oftentimes we found we find a challenge. I think the willingness for us to work in partnership very much there. How does this translate on the ground to make sure that we are having sequenced, prioritized, and indeed uh, effective uh, uh, um, interventions that result in a real change, a transformative change on the ground is what we would need uh, to look at. What is it that we have seen here? I think there is certainly a reaffirmation that the interconnectivity, which uh, oftentimes is you know, raised in the context of the global value chains, but I think it, to me, this, this uh, period has actually illustrated that that connectivity goes beyond the economics. It's connectivity in all ways, and we try to see how we try to support the different countries in trying to ensure that we are responding in a way that is, uh, uh, progresses their intentions. So we need to, uh, in this new context, uh, also take into account that we have to be innovative in our approach and perhaps focus on what has not been the norm in the past. So a new norm, in, if I may use that, uh, terminology, a new way of doing things, looking more perhaps at the digital divide. From our side, we also look at issues of investment facilitation. This is going to be a critical element of the recovery phase. These are aspects that we should be looking at. But more importantly is making sure that we retain the multilateral context. And that multilateral context being one that is reflected by members showing full commitment to the ongoing conversations within the context of the WTO and beyond. Within that context, it's important that we also look at the aspect of bringing in the gender lens. We have, uh, in the context of the ministerial meeting in Buenos Aires, uh, come up with what we consider to be a good tool to give a sense as to where the issues are and what needs to be done. And together with the full partnership, uh, we have worked towards creating more understanding around these issues, but we need to take it a step further and make sure that we are operationalizing this within the context of the uh, multilateral discussions, but more so operationally at the country level. Um, I perhaps would want uh, to end by saying that the, the title that we have given to the webinar is more than uh, befitting, um, but I would want to add to that and say, 
we will only be successful if we take a balanced approach. A balanced approach that deals with the health side of things, but at the same time is also starting to address the social and economic aspects to make sure that we are well positioned for the recovery. So maybe I could stop here, uh, Chair, and uh, um, we'll await any comments or questions that will come. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Ms. Tembo, for having brought this absolutely crucial dimension to our uh, discussion and give us so many indications about the, the economic impact of the COVID crisis and uh, the fact that, again, women are probably most affected by uh, this uh, economic downturn that we will have to expect. And this will certainly give a new meaning to uh, this formula, leaving no one behind. And as you said, the challenge for all of us will be in operationalizing then the SDGs on the ground. And I do hope that we will have a, an opportunity to get back to that, because that seems to me to be crucial to find ways to operationalize. But let's stay with the uh, economic dimension. And I would like to turn last and definitely not least to uh, Ms. Liz Kingo, the CEO and Executive Director of the UN Global Compact. As you probably know, the Global Compact is the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative. Prior to joining the Global Compact, uh, Ms. Kingo played a leading role in the company Novo Nordisk in uh, Denmark. And I'm thrilled to have you with us on the panel. And I would like to ask you the following two questions, Ms. Kingo. In your view, and based on the women's empowerment principles established together by the uh, Global Compact and UN Women, what is the role of businesses and the private sector as a whole in supporting women in this crisis? And second, do you see any opportunities to shape gender equitable uh, economics, eco sorry, economic and business practices with this crisis? What impacts do you foresee on the future of work? The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Selviger. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you today with a distinguished panel, uh, all the participants in, in different parts of the world. Um, I think this is a great initiative and uh, I'm a very proud New York international gender champion. So it's great to see that we can use this network to really drive the, the gender dimension of the pandemic. So um, I will try to be uh, very brief, but I just want us to um, go back a few steps and remind ourselves that um, before the pandemic began, we actually had as a global community serious challenges in terms of uh, economic gender parity. Already by then, the World Economic Forum had calculated that it would take more than, I think, 250 years before the world would see uh, equal gender parity. So we were not in a good situation before we uh, were hit by the pandemic um, on this particular issue. What has happened after COVID-19 is that gender equality has been put under even further pressure, which was exactly what the world didn't need. Um, and a couple of examples of this is clearly that 60% of women's employment today is actually in the informal e economy, um, in the sectors uh, that are being hit hardest by unemployment, and they are there without protection uh, against dismissal and limited access to social protection. Another uh, troubling data point is that domestic violence has increased uh, with at least 25% in some countries due to the lockdowns. So we are dealing with a really, really significant challenge across the world. So I'm happy that we have good guidance, like the women empowerment principles, 
that Compact Coin together with UN Women uh, more than 10 years ago. It started with 39 companies. Today, there are more than 3,000 companies all over the world that have committed to seven principles for how to promote women uh, in an organization, but also across society. So this is in place. Um, uh, we are seeing many, many companies having gender equality uh, on their agenda. We see close to 70% of companies setting targets for how they want to include a larger proportion of women in the way they run uh, their companies. But as I will revert to in a moment, we need businesses to become more ambitious based on the backdrop that we are discussing today. But let me give you one example of how a company in today's situation that are both a participant of the UN Global Compact, but also have signed up <clears throat> to the Women Empowerment Principles are actually putting this into action. So one of the major players um, in the world in terms of the whole beauty segment is a company called Natura. I'm sure you know it really well, uh, based in Brazil. Uh, so um, as a consequence of the COVID pandemic, they have launched a completely new website called Hash, Isolated Not Alone campaign, where they are encouraging women across the world to really come forward and to come together uh, to raise awareness around domestic abuse. So they are also in many other uh, instances in their supply chain through uh, all their shops, uh, through all their interaction with women, promoting that this is the moment to stand up uh, for women. Uh, we are also seeing other companies uh, offering flexible work arrangements, um, which can give um, a better paid, paid sick family emergency leave. And we are also seeing many companies really supporting uh, their supply chain, and also in particular uh, companies that are being led by women. So, <clears throat> The UN Global Compact issued a call to action by the end of February, really uh, asking all companies in the Compact to consider our 10 principles of human rights, labor, anti-corruption, and the environment in the way um, they are addressing the COVID pandemic. So it's good to see many, many different examples of this. And I invite you all to go and check out our website where we have a number of great videos actually put there by CEOs who are talking about <clears throat> how each of them are addressing COVID in, in each uh, their way. But let's revert to the ambition level. So clearly the issue of gender equality in the world is not solving itself by just waiting. So we made a decision at the UN Global Compact even before we knew about the COVID pandemic that we had to take special action to make the global goals a reality and really accelerate the goals. And if you look across the goals, I think most of us are, are well aware that the biggest gaps are on climate and on inequality. So, uh, and, and social uh, inequalities. So, we have launched a, an initiative across our more than 70 local networks where we are asking companies to set very ambitious targets 30% women in management and on boards, and really drive a very concrete target and also be public about the target to make sure that we can accelerate and really drive uh, the gender dimension of the global goals. So the SDG ambition 
that we are very keen on driving as uh, one way, uh, one part of the road to recovery is really, really important. And without much better gender equality uh, than we have today, it's clear that we are not going to make the global goals by uh, 2030. And I think it's very clear that whereas before the pandemic, we were encouraging businesses and stakeholders across the world to really commit to making the global goals a reality. Now that we are in a completely new situation, this is not an option anymore. It's something that simply needs to happen because we cannot go back to a situation where we do as we used to do. We need to develop a completely new normal for how to create a new way of running businesses, of running organizations, of managing ourselves that really makes the global goals a reality and that takes a very strong starting point in improving gender equality because that is <clears throat> definitely one of the preconditions for recovering better and stronger from the situation we are in at the moment. So Ambassador uh, Selvega, let me end here so we can also have uh, a chance for uh, some dialogue. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you also for leaving space for the dialogue. I will do the same. I will not sum up the debate we had so far. But let me just perhaps highlight one thing that has really struck me because it's like a common theme in all the different topics. We had the perspective of a national, uh, a national perspective, uh, the, what happened in Italy. We had a community-based uh, perspective and we had indications about the economic consequences, the devastating consequences. But I think one thing was, or one idea was common to all of you uh, on the panel, is the fact that we are at a crossroads now at this stage. Either turn, uh, things will turn much worse uh, because of this uh, pandemic, because of the crisis, or we can use this uh, opportunity to really improve many of the things we care about. And most importantly, climate has been mentioned, but I think in our context, it's more important also to address the issue of inequality. Uh, if we wish to make progress on uh, diminishing inequalities, it's now the time to do it. And it was also very clear from all your contributions that this involves the policy level. It's up to governments, it's up to all the policy makers, including the multilateral level, and that is where we come in, to now get things done in the right way and to create what some of you have called this new normal. That really should be our goal for this post-COVID recovery phase. Having said this, I would like now to, I would first like to thank you very much for your uh, inspiring and rich contributions. And I would like to hand over to Fleur um, from the Secretariat to moderate the questions and answers. Please, Fleur, you have the Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Zellweger, and thank you to all our panelists for your rich contributions to the discussion. Um, we have two uh, questions so far, and we will probably only take one round in view of the time. Um, and so for everyone's um, information, the broadcasting on YouTube has now stopped. Uh, so this is an opportunity for a more uh, open discussion amongst the network where we can really hopefully enrich some of the viewpoints that champions and focal points bring.